When I first started doing reviews on YouTube, I always knew that I wanted to tackle one series in particular. Sure, I've got Metroid Month to look forward to every year now, but there's another set of games that has meant more to me than any other, and I just can't wait to share my thoughts on it any longer. Not many franchises can claim the same amount of praise, acclaim, and influence as Zelda. This is a series that helped set the template of what players could expect from a grand interactive adventure. It wasn't the first attempt at this to find success, far from it, but while games like Adventure on the Atari helped set the trend, Zelda may be the earliest of its kind in the genre to carry over that recognition and still be wildly remembered as a classic even to this day. Not to mention just how strongly the series has stood tall in the industry as one of the standards people still look to when setting forth to develop a fantasy adventure title. Even games like Dark Souls and Dark Siders have taken some clear inspiration from Nintendo's legendary franchise. There's really only so much introduction I can offer to a series like this. I guess our best bet is to just hop right in. In this little marathon, we'll be taking a look at Zelda 1, Zelda 2, A Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, and Ocarina of Time. I'm not going to be worrying about any remakes for the time being, and I'm not going to be worrying about Majora's Mask until later on, but trust me, we'll get to that one. As for right now, let's not waste any more time and hop right into the game that started it all. Spoilers for a 35-year-old game, this is The Legend of Zelda. For anyone uninitiated, The Legend of Zelda was the little brainchild of one Shigeru Miyamoto, an undoubtedly brilliant man and a crucial figure of the game industry, but also maybe one of the leading examples where we may have let the overwhelming praise get just a little bit out of hand. Still, humble enough beginnings, this was a guy who started as an artist for the company in its early years, and out of sheer luck of the draw, he was tasked with converting some old radar scope machines into cartridge format, where he was able to springboard to new projects, like a certain Italian plumber rescuing his girlfriend from a rampaging gorilla. In time, Nintendo was able to help bring the game industry back from the edge of collapse after the market crashed in 1983 with the revolutionary Famicom and the overseas equivalent, the NES. Now, I had always assumed that the Famicom is where The Legend of Zelda made its debut, and well, that's sort of true, but it was actually one of the first games to usher in Nintendo's Famicom disc system, which used something basically akin to a floppy disc in this machine that would attach to the bottom of the base console and allowed for what was, at the time, some pretty impressive features, including the ability to save game data and an extra sound sound channel. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to play the original Japanese release of this game, you'll notice a lot of music and sound effects are different. The base compositions are the same, but there's a little more dynamic than what was possible for the cartridge counterparts. Makes me really want to get my hands on this Japanese system at some point, but of course, we weren't left high and dry over here. The Nintendo Entertainment System never had any kind of disc-based peripheral, so naturally a cartridge version of the game needed to be created. They went all out for this too, giving the game this gorgeous gold coating. They even have a spot open in the box just for a peek to make it all the more enticing, and not wanting NES players to miss out on the best features, they also made The Legend of Zelda the first home-based game with a battery backup installed in the cartridge to allow for saving game data. This version of the game is still missing that extra sound channel, but the music of the game was still being handled by Koji Kondo, so there was never a chance it was going to sound bad by any stretch. Now, I'm sure by now someone has brought up the fact that at this point, this game, its history, all that stuff has been talked about quite a bit, so what more is there for this generic Harry Potter, Peter Parker, Scott the Waz looking nerd supposed to say? And yes, there has been a lot of discussion about this game over the years, but I am going to try to tackle it from a very specific angle. This game has aged, and not all in positive ways, and we are going to go over the flaws and why this isn't exactly the easiest game to recommend to your average player in this day and age, but anyone can tell you why a game is bad. I'm going to do my best to look under the hood and find what elements really held this game up. What made this stand taller than the games around it, and how did this game manage to serve as the foundation to an unforgettable legacy? The best place to start might be with the spirit that the game was created in to begin with. This title was developed under the lead of Miyamoto and Takahashi Tezuka, and was being designed along with Super Mario. 
Mario Brothers. Mario was establishing the groundwork that platformers would follow for years to come, evolving the previously released Pac-Man spin-off called Pac-Land and fleshing it out into one of the most recognizable games ever put to code. The Legend of Zelda, on the other hand, was essentially made to be the opposite. Mario moves in one direction across his levels. Most of the time, you can't go back to a part of the stage you've already passed, and you have a single track to travel in just with the challenge of overcoming obstacles along the way. This little fantasy adventure title had a different goal, create a world where the player could set off in any direction and determine their own path to victory. There's a single destination, but you can take any number of roads you want to get there. It's easy to see how this would eventually evolve into what we recognize as the sprawling open world adventures that have become so incredibly commonplace in today's market. Maybe it doesn't seem like much on the surface, but you really didn't see this kind of open world, something this big and well structured in games back then. It helped that it had a spark of lore to elevate it too. Sure, you had the standard quest of rescuing the titular Princess Zelda after she was kidnapped by the evil beast known as Ganon who stormed the land of Hyrule with an army of monsters, stealing a powerful artifact known as the Triforce of Power, a source of raw divine energy in the form of a golden triangle that he uses to spread his influence across the land. Before she was captured, Princess Zelda took the Triforce of Wisdom in an attempt to keep it from the clutches of Ganon and split it into eight pieces, scattering them across dungeons lying beneath the earth of the kingdom. Now, if you've played a few Zelda games yourself, you might be wondering where the Triforce of Courage is, the last piece of the trio. Well, it doesn't exist. Not yet, anyway. The Triforce wasn't this recognizable little boy band of yellow shapes until a couple of games later. In this title, you just get two of them, not the complete set. Still, Ganon has Zelda, his monsters are running amok, and the people of Hyrule are left cowering away in caves, truly the darkest days of this proud land, so it falls on the young man Link, who rescues Zelda's aide, Impa, who informs him of the princess's role as the resident damsel in distress. From there, you must take on the role of Link and set forth to scour the dungeons of Hyrule, collect the pieces of the Triforce, and bring peace back to the land. Simple though this story may be, there's enough elements here to keep the action engaging, but I also think that the setting has just enough elements with unique attributes. Yeah, Zelda isn't really doing much in this game, but there was at least some effort to have her show some initiative. Having her scatter the main MacGuffin all over the map gives her a bit of agency, and it shows her having an acute understanding of her kingdom and the secrets that it holds. Would have been nice to see her do literally anything in the game itself, but if she hadn't been on top of things before the start of the title, Ganon would have just gotten the Triforce of Wisdom and there wouldn't even be a quest to begin with. Plus, it's, uh, more than the next Zelda would do in the succeeding game, but we'll get to that next time. Ganon and the Triforce also help this game stand apart. The Triforce is a powerful artifact with ambiguous abilities and a catchy name. It's got a bit of history and mystery behind it, but it's also an incredibly easy concept to understand. Ganon is the same way, and instead of being just another evil dragon or wizard as many fantasy style adventures would resort to, he's this big, weird pig monster, and even just that one differing detail was probably enough to make him more memorable. Now, why does any of this matter? Well, I've already talked about one of my golden rules, that your main method of travel in a game needs to be enjoyable on its own, but this series would later highlight another crucial aspect of game design, that being communication. Thing is, a game can only communicate to you once you're listening. Getting across an enticing premise can be one of the most important things a game can accomplish. The hardest thing to do is to get someone's attention, but once you have it, you just have to keep it, and that's often where the gameplay comes in. And in terms of gameplay, what's here is still pretty solid. I think of this game in two parts, exploring the overworld and completing dungeons. The land of Hyrule itself is actually laid out in a really good way here. I think the overall structure is rather pleasing, but there's also a sense of variety here, and that helps with both keeping anything from being too redundant and making it feel more alive. And it helps certain locations stand out more, and that way you're spending more time exploring and less time getting lost. And yes, there is a difference, with a big part of that being a meaningful payoff. There's actually a nice balance to what you can find out there in the higher than it is low rule, and it starts right at the very first screen. You're basically naked at the start, not even fashioning a sword until you step into the cave in front of you and receive it from this old man. It's not like you're doing much to earn anything here, you walk straight and then you're rewarded for it, but what matters is that the game has just taught the player how it will communicate with them for the rest of the quest. You didn't have to do much to find your main weapon in the game, but you still had to put in some kind of effort. This game isn't just handing stuff out for free, you have to go out of your way to find it. You're only as powerful as you make yourself, so off you go to expand your arsenal, and it's generally recommended that you do a bit of this before entering your first dungeon. Right from the get-go, you can collect rupees as currency from enemies that you encounter, bombs that you can use to blast holes in certain walls of rock to reveal shops. You can run across these places where you choose a potion to refill your health, or a heart container which will permanently increase your overall health, which why even give me a choice, just give me that thing, get out of here. Or you can even find kindly moblins who don't really seem interested in the conquest of Hyrule, they just give you rupees for finding them. Actually, I feel like this should be touched on a bit more, because it's not like this sort of thing is common in the rest of the series. Are these troops that just lost faith in Ganon?
cannon? Is the allure of taking over Hyrule not good enough, or are you just lazy? It's just moblins, too. Like, no other enemy seems this friendly to Link. You think the Lynels would be so charitable? <laughs> yeah, no, not a chance. Either way, stand-up job, guys. Thanks for the money. With the funds you collect, you can purchase refills on items like bombs or potions after taking a letter from some old geezer to the woman station in some caves, as well as some bigger upgrades like a larger shield or a ring that will let you resist more damage. Once you have enough heart containers, you can even discover upgrades to your sword, like the white sword when you have five heart containers and the magic sword when you have 12. The amount of damage you can output with this is incredibly helpful, and as you beef up your offense and defense, you'll become a much more capable hero. And this Freeform progression is the biggest element that strengthens the qualities of this title. And of course, the better equipped you are, the better you'll do when you start tackling dungeons. Each one is laid out as a series of interconnected rooms, and by clearing each, you'll defeat enemies, collect keys, unlock doors, and find goodies like new key items, I'll touch on those more in a second, find a map that will lay out the structure of the maze, a compass that will show you rooms holding objects of interest, and of course, bosses to fight. Now, many of these bosses aren't very complicated, especially if it's one of these dragons. You just have to dodge the fireballs they hurl at you and stab him in the head. There are some that will require some special sort of solution to hurt them, like making the Dodongo eat bombs, shooting Goma with arrows, or using the flute on the Dig Dogger to make it vulnerable to standard attacks. Some of these weaknesses are communicated through text blurbs. These old dudes in the temples will give you among other hints that are actually pretty helpful at times and will require a small amount of critical thinking from the player, but others are... Uh, what am I supposed to do with this information? Now that brings me to a kind of important part of the game. When I was talking about Metroid, I mentioned that using a guide or a map of some kind was probably the best way to get the most out of that experience, and I would probably say the same for this one. Thing is, the developers would probably agree with me. Why do I say that? Because they packaged a map in the box! I actually think this was a good way to handle it at the time. You get a decent idea of where the first couple of dungeons are, but a lot of it is still left up to you, and I honestly think there's less need for a full guide with this game than there was for Metroid. On a personal note, I don't have much of a visual memory. I literally struggle to form images in my head on the same level other people can, so it makes something like Metroid with its incredibly samey looking corridors hard to navigate through, but with this game, stuff is much more distinct. Sure, it gets more confusing in the dungeons, but at least you can get a map there too, so you can keep your tabs on your general location. What also helps is how some areas and items are closed off from you until you have some sort of key item, kind of like with Metroid. Use the flute to uncover the entrance to a dungeon, or to teleport to entrances of others that you've already completed. Use this step ladder to cross a single square of water, or use this raft to travel across a whole body of it. The more you explore the overworld, the better you'll fare in the temples, and the more you find in those, the more of the overworld you can explore. Topping it all off is the ability to do pretty much any of this in whatever order you see fit, and people have gone wild with this freeform nature of the game, too. With some of the more famous examples being the self-imposed challenges like a three-heart run where you don't collect any heart containers from the overworld or from beating bosses or the madmen out there who've gone through the entire game without even picking up the sword. Where some of this starts to break down is how certain items are actually used to progress through Hyrule. Again, some walls can be destroyed with bombs to lead to doors to find secrets. Sometimes it's a shop or a cryptic hint, but sometimes you get this crusty old fart who charges you for door repairs because you just blew up the entrance to his home. Not only would you have to go insane, planting bombs basically every everywhere until you get lucky, not accounting for the time and rupees going into stocking up on more of those, but then you have to get punished for the dedication to this silly design? Then there's torching bushes. You can collect a variety of candles that will allow you to burn down bushes to discover secrets, some of which are things like pieces of heart, pretty important items, I'm sure you'll agree, and again, there's nothing setting these things apart. If you aren't using a guide or haven't been told where this stuff is, you just have to burn absolutely everything until you just stumble onto something. The excuse of this game nature to make you explore and discover things runs out eventually, and it's definitely prior to the 50th bush you rain hellfire on. And then there's one dungeon with a moblin that just says, grumble grumble. Well, what the hell does that mean? We've already established the moblins don't seem to like Ganon all that much, so what are you grumbling about? The work hours? No, no, he's actually hungry, and I guess that's supposed to be the sound of his stomach, and the solution to getting past him is finding this really expensive hunk of meat out in the overworld to feed him with. I feel like there could have been an easier way to get this across, in fact, I'm sure of it. And then there's Ganon's dungeon. Once you collect the shards of the Triforce from all eight dungeons, you can enter Ganon's lair and spectacle rock and get ready to have a hard time. This place. 
Man, I get that it's the final temple, gotta make it more of a challenge and all that, but this is a lot. This place is absolutely enormous, it's hiding several key items in secret rooms, one of which is the silver arrows which you need if you want to actually kill the final boss. It's like the meat thing again, but like 10 times worse. So many rooms that look exactly the same, some routes that lead absolutely nowhere, whiz rubs and dark knights coming to slap me in the next week, and yep, I need a map for this one. I only have so many hours in my life to dedicate to this kind of nonsense, and I mean look, I'll put in the effort if the challenge is fun, but not if the challenge is set up like this. Get geared up, collect the final ring to beef up your defense, grab the silver arrows, and go teach the baby back final boss a lesson. You use the Triforce to illuminate the room, revealing him before he starts teleporting around the arena. Honestly, you can just start running around in a circle, stabbing wildly at the air, and eventually you'll hit him enough times to stun him. Shoot him with the silver arrow, and he'll just go down. Collect the Triforce of Power, rescue Zelda, and that's the game. You can actually play through the game again on what's called the second quest. Really just a more challenging remix of the game. Stuff is in a new order, the dungeons are laid out differently, some of the maps even come together to spell Zelda, it's, you know, that's cute. It's really only worth your time if you just really, really love this game. Know the layout front and back and just want to test your knowledge of Hyrule, definitely not something I would call mandatory. That kind of goes for this game as a whole. Personally, I actually really like this game, and I find its charm, rewarding gameplay loop, and simple pick-up-and-play nature to be really endearing. I can play through this game in a couple of hours, tops. It's not a long venture, but it's time well spent to me. Still, for general audiences, I'd say it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's always worth it to give it a shot, especially since it's so easily accessible. Like, just boot up the NES app on your Switch, it's right there and ready to play. I'd recommend giving it a shot without any outside help, but once you feel like you've hit a wall, just feel free to pull up a map, nobody can shame you. The way this game handles communication was probably perfect for its time. Just enough answers out of reach that help preserve the magic sitting inside that little cartridge, but nowadays, those methods of communication may as well be in another language entirely. It's just not how we gather information from games anymore. All the same, give it a shot if you feel so inclined, and maybe you can find some joy in the humble beginnings of The Legend of Zelda. The first step in a retrospective of my favorite game series. I'm really excited to keep looking through these titles and seeing how my opinions of them may have changed over the years, or how I look at them now that I play games with a more critical eye. Either way, I think our next trip to Hyrule will be pretty interesting, so I hope you'll join me next time as we take a look at Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link. Until then, remember that my top tier patrons get to see these videos two days early. You can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Discord, whichever you prefer. Links in the description, and of course, as always, spread the word, tell your friends, and until we see each other again, thank you so much for watching. See you next mission. Hey there everyone, thanks again so much for watching. I'm, I'm sorry for being gone for so long, but at the same time, you know, I, I I really hate these little hiatuses, especially when they're not planned. It's one thing if I could be like, hey, I'm gonna be taking a little break for a while, but it's like if, if I'm actually meaning to get videos made and put together and, and released, it's frustrating when that's not happening, and I imagine that's the same thing for the audience, especially those of you that, that have been like donating money through Patreon and that sort of thing. Thank you all so much for your continued support, though. I, it really means a lot that you would uh, you would stick through all of that, even uh, even through the radio silence. It means the absolute world. And of course, I do want to thank my my top tier patrons. Those being Patricia Marcou, Christine Larkin, Earl Valco, Nicholas Morgan, Jacob Riley, Monton Photo, and Cirrus the Skeptic. Thank you guys so so much for watching. You do make it possible. You do make it worth it. And I love you guys. It, it's it means again. It just means so much that you would stick with me, um, even when I'm just not really getting much done. Hopefully, uh, you know, now that I've I've gotten something out again, I'm uh, just kind of back on the horse. I'm, I'm getting back into this uh, creation headspace and everything like that. I can stick with the Zelda series for a little bit. It's it's a more comfortable place for me to be. I'll try again with the Gravity Rush 2 review later on. We'll see how that goes. And, um, yeah, I am excited to see where the rest of these Zelda reviews go, and, of course, I also want to start compiling some stuff together for Metroid Month. That actually is probably going to come up fast, that'll probably sneak up on me, and I have a lot of footage and everything to gather before that happens. So thank you all so much for watching, I have to go ahead and get all of this video stuff edited and, and get it out for you guys, and, uh, I have been Wayne, and I don't have a clever outro this time. And I'll work on that for the next review. Alright, peace.